Hey y'all, Tata Guy here. And today I wanted to make a video that is just gonna go through pretty much every different data format out there for big data, for working with big data, uh, with the goal of kind of just showing you, hey, what are all these different data types good for? CSV, JSON, Parquet, um, and many, and a couple more. So not just the ones up here, we're gonna go through, I think around six. Um, and just kind of tell you, our, hey, what are their pros? What are their cons? What systems do they work well with? And kind of just give you an understanding of, you know, what they're actually designed for. Um, because it's something that, you know, me as a data engineer, just coming into this space, you know, I know what a CSV file is, I know what a JSON file is, but I don't really know why they were designed this way. Um, so I wanted to kind of explore that on my own and figure out, hey, what is the reasoning behind, you know, why do CSVs, why are JSON structured the way they are? Because I personally hate JSON. But <clears throat> that's enough digression. Um, and to my personal opinion is I really just want to take an objective look at all these data types um, and give you kind of the understanding that I lacked when I first uh, entered the Dataverse. Um, so without further ado, let's get into it. So the first data type we have is a JSON uh, file. So JSON, uh, in stands for JavaScript Object Notation, is a lightweight text-based format for data interchange between systems. Um, so it's meant to be like really easy to read and write as a human, um, and also easy to parse and generate for machines. Um, and as you can see in this example, it kind of structures data as key value pairs. So doors window uh, is an array of different objects within these. So we have our main JSON object, which is you know just an array of windows. Uh, then we have different types of door windows, uh, which you can see here, ID A, that represents an object of a style roller with a height of three, width of three, front, um, and then it can also contain subarrays like a location where you actually have an array of numbers, uh, maybe for latitude or longitude. Um, and you keep nesting kind of these uh, key value pairs uh, inside each other, nested objects, um, and fold them all up um, into you know, one large object. So it's kind of just a Russian Matryoshka doll almost of data. Um, and it's really versatile for representing you know, either simple to moderately complex data structures. As you can imagine, when you're constantly nesting objects inside of each other, you kind of get that it just, hey, you know, you're, it's a loop of a loop of a nest of a nest of a nest. And so it's difficult at, for really complex data, but for simple things like, hey, keeping track of customer attributes. Uh, JSON is a really you know, versatile way, and you can just say, hey, take this form data that a customer filled out and store them as an object. Um, and you know, some of the pros of this are it's very human readable, it's very simple and concise, so it's pretty easy to understand even if you're not super technically savvy, um, and it's very widely supported. So it's language agnostic, you, know, you can pipe JSON data into, almost, you know, into Python, into SQL. Um, it's got support in many different programming languages and makes it ideal for APIs and you know, web services. So most APIs send JSON data. Um, and it's also really fast parsing because it's lightweight. It's just you know, nesting objects. JSON can be pretty quickly parsed and then also used by web applications. So when web applications need to pass data between each other, they'll typically use JSON because it's just really quickly to send, hey, just the object I need rather than a whole like database table. Now, some of the drawbacks of JSON style data is it's pretty limited in terms of the data types it supports. Um, and that means like more complex things like floats, um, you know, so it may not be sufficient for really complex or specific data representation needs if you're using kind of like really left of field or left of curve um, data types. And then there's not really strict schema enforcement. You know, JSON, as you can see here, doesn't really support schema validation. There's no overall structure other than just like you're an object of an object. Um, so this can be lead to potential issues with, you know, data quality, consistency. Obviously, there are ways to get around that and support them. But by default, you know, it doesn't really have its own kind of internal structure other than just, you know, being a series of objects that contain characteristics about those objects. Um, so that's kind of JSON in a nutshell. Now, the next data type we're going to look at is, in my view, the most esoteric uh, data type, uh, and that is XML, which is Extensible Markup Language. Now, I personally did not know a lot about, about XML going into this, um, but it is very widely used um, and for whatever reason, because it, it has a language that defines a set of rules for encoding documents in a format that is both human readable and machine readable. Um, and this allows the definition of custom tags um, in a really highly flexible way to structure data. And you can kind of see an example here where it's similar to almost like a markdown document, 
hence markup language, um, where you're defining your type of XML you're using, then the document type. So what, you know, this is a, in this case, describing a car. Uh, then we have a root element. So in each type of data within, you know, an XML document, you'll have a car, which is almost like an object. Um, and then there'll be a comment on this car. So saying this is a list of parts for a convertible car. And then you have a list of elements which can represent data around that car. So seat quantity, wheel quantity, um, the type of engine, uh, and then you can see here at the end, you'll just close that object um, with this, again, root element end tag. Um, and this is, XML's really good for really kind of custom data structures where you don't want to have the typical rigidity of, you know, putting this into a schema um, or even the rigidity of like a JSON um, because this gives you the ability to define new tags, really use whatever type of data you want. Um, and it's very self-descriptive because you're literally commenting <laughs> what your data is about within the document. So it can be really, you know, you kind of make it really easy to understand without external documentation because the documentation is right alongside the data. Um, and then there is also schema validation. So you can actually define schema definitions um, and kind of ensure strict data validation consistency. So making sure, hey, every car has to have a comment and these elements and these characters um, and this amount of data before it you know, can be decided or declared as valid. Um, but with kind of the more I almost think of it as a more complex or more customizable JSON type. Um, but with all this customizability, it can be quite large and verbose in these files. Like as you can see here, there's just a ton of kind of extraneous boilerplate um, info here that would be abstracted out. You know, if you had, let's say, a column for quantity. Um, and so this means, you know, you're going to probably need increased storage requirements and also slower processing in terms of actually reading this data when you're a computer. Um, and then also, the flexibility and the customizability can also be a drawback because you can see how these complex structures can get really, really difficult to manage and parse, you know, when you start to get more complex and it's kind of those enterprise grade or, you know, really large use cases where you need to maybe have 500 different cars in a file. That's not going to be a fun file to look through if it's an XML. Now, the next data type we have is a parquet file. Um, and when you're first looking at a parquet file, it kind of just looks like a typical, you know, data table you'd see in any kind of database. Um, that's because it kind of is. Um, it is a columnar storage format that is optimized for use with big data processing frameworks. And what that means is it stores data in columns instead of rows. And then parquet also uses row groups to organize data as well. So you can see here you'll have kind of groups of, you know, sets of rows. Um, and then you'll also have columns uh, where data is stored in that. And what that has the effect of doing is it's designed to really efficiently store and process large volumes of data by saying, hey, maybe I don't need to search through every row. I just need to search in row group one to actually get the data I need. Um, and so it can really enable much more efficient data com compression and encoding schemes um, because Parquet files are essentially compressed by default um, and that reduces storage requirements and costs as well. And it's optimized for read performance, as I just mentioned, because that columnar format allows for efficient data retrieval, especially for like analytical queries that process large volumes of data, because you can just search, hey, within one column, search for that exact query you want, um, instead of needing to search across all columns and all rows um, in the entire set data table at once. Um, and so that makes it really good for analytical queries that process large volumes of data. Um, and then it also supports uh, complex data types as well. So instead of, you know, this, this row group could actually be a data type. So ball and t-shirt, you know, this is my sports equipment, right? Um, and so that could be a nested data structure within a parquet file. Um, and so that makes it really suitable for more complex data models where even, you know, within a data table, you also need to say, hey, maybe you do have kind of an object representing a series of rows that are all grouped together, like a team of people. Um, now, some of the downsides of all of these great features are, you know, writing performance, uh, writing data to Parquet can be slower than other formats because you need to compress the data and then also encode it. Um, and so as part of that process, you know, when you're writing that, you know, uploading that data into a Parquet file, it's just going to take longer because that data needs to go to that extra step. Um, and then also it's a little bit more complex in terms of processing because while it offers significant advantages for, you know, big data analytics, it might not be as straightforward for just like a simple, I need to send a, you know, data uh, a quick file about a person to another application. So between web applications, it's not really the most efficient um, data type to actually use. So now our next data type is probably the one I use the most um, and you're probably the most familiar with, and that is CSV or comma separated values um, data files. Now CSVs are very simple data format that is store used to store tabular data like a spreadsheet, like 
you know, when you're uh, working in an Excel document, most of the time that's going to spit out a CSV. Um, or a database, you know, when you're uploading into a Snowflake, you're probably going to upload a CSV. Um, and so essentially here, each line in the file corresponds to a data record with each column separated by a comma here. So in this case, we have uh, keyword, min, monthly, uh, volume, max monthly volume. So you can see here our keyword is BI soft, then 11, then 50. You know, this is just some random CSV I found online. Um, and then Southwest Virtual Agents 010. And you can see each of these data points is represented by its own kind of bracketed comma. Um, and then there's also some that are empty. So even if you don't have an entry for that field, you still have to add that um, as an empty kind of common value so you don't you know, have a row that isn't of the proper length. So within CSVs, every row needs to be the same length. Um, and CSV files are very straightforward to, you know, to understand and use. So they're ideal for small data sets, quick data exchanges. They're really easy to get started with. Um, and pretty much every data processing program under the sun supports CSVs. Um, so it's got a lot of flexibility in how you can actually use and analyze that data. Um, and then also really easy to edit it. If I want to change a field, open a text edit editor, put in a new value or a spreadsheet application, boom, super easy. Um, however, because it is kind of simple, you have limited data complexity supported within CSVs. So CSVs don't support nested or hierarchical data structures, making them kind of unsuitable for more complex data uh, method or storage needs. And then there's also a lack of type safety. So all data in CSV is treated as text, and that can lead to issues with you know, data types and integrity. Um, and then finally, you know, there's no standard schema. So you know, when you're just defining this, you're not defining a schema, you're just defining kind of a single table. So your column names and data types should be agreed upon you know, separately or inferred. So you can't say keyword needs to be a string, but you need to make sure that every keyword is actually a string. Um, so you know, kind of a catch-22 there almost. Um, but yeah, that's CSVs in a nutshell. Now next we have Abro files. Um, and Abro is a binary serialization format that was developed for Apache Hadoop. Um, and this supports schema-based data serialization and deserialization. So basically encoding it and de-encoding it with the schemas defined in JSON. Um, so you can see here, you know, if I wanted to uh, produce a JSON or Abro file, I would write it in the in this kind of you know, sequential format where I have you know, each of these entries in a field, so each kind of object's almost like a JSON. Um, and then I can write that to an Abra file, and then an actual Abra file will look like something like this. Um, so you can see here, it's similar to a JSON file. Um, you know, the schemas are defined in JSON. However, they, are, they all support schema evolution. Um, so while Abra files, you know, they're compact, fast to read and write, you can see here, you know, it just got a lot less kind of empty context and space than a JSON file of the same data would be. Um, so they're really well suited for high volume data exchange and storage for you know just small kind of quickly passed pieces of data similar to JSON, but they support schema evolution, which you know allowing backward and forward compatibility, which is essential for long lived data st storage systems where you can see you can have actual explicit data types. You can have arrays of type string of artists where you know you would have to have all this whole extra you know kind of spelled out within a JSON file this record entity can exist separate from just this JSON blocks. So you can have an, ar an array of different record entities, right? Um, and so this you know, allows for basically more complex data types and structures than a JSON file would allow um, while still being relatively compact and, and fast to read and write. And so being a binary format, so that's why I showed you kind of this way of writing it, they're not human readable without processing. So while this data would be stored, you know, it's similarly to how it looks like in a JSON, you'll notice the actual data isn't really there. So you have to read out from that Avro file what that data is because it's all in binary, so it's all zeros and ones under the hood. So a little bit harder to debug and manual inspections, and that's why it doesn't really have as clear an example as I had on previous data types because you're basically going to take your data and code it into this Avro data type, and by doing that, it's going to be more com compact, faster to read and write for the machines, but trade-off is it's less uh, understandable to read for an actual human. Um, and so, you know, schema requirement, you can see the schema kind of defined here. So your columns, the data frame. Um, so, you know, kind of the more of that complexity you can contain within there. Um, and it also requires a schema for data serialization and, and deserialization. And that just means processing the data out of that, you know, binary format and into it, um, which can add an additional layer of complexity in some scenarios. So that is Avro um, in a nutshell. Uh, it's a little bit kind of complex to get your head around, but once you think of it, hey, you know, taking JSON and like compressing it into an actual, you know, organized structure, it, that's how I made sense of it.
Uh, so now we have our next data type, our last one, which is ORC, Optimized Row Columnar. Um, so ORC is a columnar storage format that offers highly efficient ways to store and process data. And you can kind of see this, you know, and I'll get into the actual specifications in a second, um, where it's designed to overcome the limitations of other formats by providing excellent compression and improving the performance of read-write operations. Um, so kind of similarly to Parquet files, you'll have these different chunks of data. So within my, you know, I'll have my row data, which is going to, you know, my index data um, contained within separate entities that I can query independently. Um, so you'll have a Stripe footer that's just, you know, contains some more information around it. File footer, which contains, you know, information about what the columns are, postscript, and then you'll have these different chunks of, you know, in this case, 250 megabytes of data um, that I can query separately so I don't have to query the entire data set at a time. Um, and so this makes ORC pretty high performance. Um, it's really designed for, you know, read heavy database workloads where, hey, I don't want to query every single piece of data. I just want to query that kind of individual chunk. Um, and so it makes it really ideal for data warehousing scenarios. Um, and then similar to Parquet files, it also implements advanced compression techniques, um, which re significantly reduces the storage space that's required for these large data sets. Um, and then also, and similarly to Parquet, so it supports com complex and nested data structures as well. So you can have those kind of groups of groups of rows, um, and that facilitates even more efficient analytics on complex data models. Um, however, and again, similarly to Parquet, you can kind of tell there's a lot of parallels here. Writing data to ORC can be slower due to its compression mechanisms because, again, it has to go through that kind of second step of you know being written to that separate language and put in that separate type. Um, and it's also pretty tightly integrated with Hadoop ecosystem tools. Um, so it's not as universally supported as you know, JSON or CSV uh, file formats in, in different environments. So just something to consider if you're thinking about going all in on, on ORC. Um, but you get to say you're using ORCs. Uh, so you know, if you're a little loading guy, might be your thing. Um, but that is all I have for you today. So just kind of wanted to go through all those different data formats and let you know what they do, how they're structured, what they are best used for. Um, and I hope it has given you a good framework for deciding which one is best for you. Um, so without further ado, Data Guy out. Have a good one, y'all.